Good morning, everyone. Can you guess who it is? Five, four, three, two, one. That's right. You guessed it right. It's me, Mr. Kyler. Just kidding. It's Mr. Paul. If you guys thought it was Mr. Kyler, then you obviously do not pay attention enough. Well, good morning, everyone. Hope you guys are doing well and staying safe. I'm glad Miss Amanda gave me the opportunity to greet you guys this morning. Uh, she asked for me to pray for you all this morning. So I'm going to pray for you all this morning and ask you to join me in prayer, whether you're watching this alone or whether your family is with you in your living room. Let's pray to God this morning. Okay, so would you guys join me in prayer? Father, we thank you, O oh God, for your grace in our lives. We praise you this morning because, God, you are worthy of our praise and surrender. We thank you, Lord, that we can still hear your word and praise your name in our homes. For many Christians in this world cannot meet freely and would risk their lives to worship you. So may we never take for granted of the blessings of being able to worship you freely in our homes with our families. God, we pray for your mercy upon this world with the coronavirus. We know that you are sovereign and that you are in control. Give us the faith, O oh God, to trust in you and the truth that you do all things for good and for your glory. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you this morning into the homes of all who are joining in worship. May your spirit bring blessings as we hear your word. And as we hear your word, may we be fed. Be glorified this morning, O God. And may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 to 28. Here is God's word. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was a cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters being a wall to them, and their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watched the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud look down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into panic, clogging their chariots' wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon the chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses 
stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared, and as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. Last week, we saw God lead the Israelites with step-by-step -step directions to a place that was right near the edge of a very vast sea. With the Egyptians in hot pursuit, the Israelites seem to be trapped at Piahiroth, and the situation throws the Israelites into a panic. And they express this in ways that they're probably not that proud of much later, such as unthankfulness, regret, fear, complaining, impatience, and doubts. Well, Moses had to calm them down, so he tells them to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He's trying to get them to see that God has already made a way out for them. In today's Bible reading, the Lord tells Moses to tell the people to go forward, but Moses has already told them to stand still. So are Moses and the Lord saying two different things? I don't think so. It's like when your mom and you are at the pool, it's a hot summer day, and she says, stay still, stand still. I'm going to put some sunscreen on you so that you don't get burnt. And so you really wanna go into the water, but you stand still. And then she says, well, what are you waiting for? And you know that's your signal, you can go. So you bolt for the pool. You see, God had to take the Israelites to a place where they knew for sure that they could not save themselves. God was going to save them for sure, but he needed them to know that it was he alone who would perform, perform their rescue. He didn't need their ideas about which route was smarter or shorter. And this was not anything about letting the Israelites choose a way that made sense to them. No way. This was about rescue. The Bible says the Israelites looked up, and what did they see? Egyptians, lots of Egyptians. This was about Hosanna, save now. In order to go forward, they had to stand still first. They had to be still and remember that the God of Israel alone is God. He will be exalted among the nations. He will be exalted in the earth and certainly above Pharaoh. Once their thoughts and their hopes were fixed on God alone, then they were ready. They were ready to go ahead. God basically says, all right, well, what are you waiting for? Actually, he says, why do you cry out to me, Moses? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. So Moses lifts his rod and the people are ready to walk through. Their hearts are filled with awe and some of them are pumped up, excited, they've got this. Others are just timidly tiptoeing along. But they all go forward, recognizing that there is no other way. As they step forward, they experienced a most amazing deliverance. A powerful wind blows. It blows the sea to the right and to the left um, so that it creates a wall. And they walk through not on this muddy, sloshy ground, but they actually walk through on ground that's completely dry. It's amazing. When they get to the other side, they are alive. They're free from the Egyptians. And just as Moses promised, they'll never see these Egyptians again. So in that way, Paya Highworth, even though it was difficult, it was exactly what they needed. So what about us? The Bible tells us we are all sinners headed towards a way of no escape. We all have sinned and fallen short of God's standards. And Romans 6.23 tells us that the payment for that is death. This is not good news. But God's word tells us that God made a way of escape. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, we can be saved from death and have a relationship with a living and holy God. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead is millions of times better or more amazing than the miracle of the Red Sea. Christ's resurrection provides complete deliverance for those of us who stand still long enough to realize we fall short of God's glory and then go forward to trust in Christ's death and resurrection. God brings each of us to our own times of Piahiroth or standing still. He uses those times to open our eyes, to see his salvation, to open our mouths, to confess, I am a sinner, and to cause our hearts to cry out, I need you, God. How about you? 
Maybe you find yourself arguing with your brother or sister more than you would like, or you say words that you shouldn't say, or think thoughts that you would be ashamed for others to know. Maybe you look at things that you shouldn't be looking at, or are listening to things that you shouldn't be listening to. Or maybe you're even taking things that aren't yours to take. Maybe you are thinking that you're pretty okay because you don't do any of those things. The Bible tells us that we are sinners, all of us, and we desperately need God to forgive us. God's word tells us that without that forgiveness, the punishment for our sins is death and eternal separation from God. When God works in our hearts so that we are able to say, God, I'm so sorry, I am a sinner, I realize that, at that point, we can also go forward, fully putting our trust in Jesus as God's only son. And when we declare that he is the one who is in charge of our lives from this point on, and believe that God raised him from the dead, God accepts us as his children and receives the glory. So what happens next? Well, even after we become Jesus's followers, we will have trouble in this world. In fact, the Bible tells us it will get much worse before Jesus comes. You might get teased. You might get left out. You might even lose a friend or two over your faith. Luke 21, 19 tells us that when these things happen, we will need to continue to stand firm. Well, maybe you think now that you don't want that kind of hardship or that kind of pain. Well, let me just tell you a story about uh, this disease that some people have where they don't experience any type of pain. The formal name of my condition is congenital insensitivity to pain. It means that I don't feel pain. I don't feel any aches either. For example, if someone stands on my foot, I won't feel it. It doesn't hurt if I accidentally cut myself while making food. When you hear all this, it sounds like a superpower, but it really isn't like that. Pain and aches are vital for our health. It was too hot when I was showering. I didn't notice it because I didn't feel any pain. I had second degree burns on my back, my arms, my neck. The next day I had blisters everywhere. If I could feel pain, I would have felt that the water was too hot and I wouldn't have been burned. People who have it say that they would give anything to be able to feel pain. Because they can't feel pain, their lives are so much harder. The Egyptians are sort of like that. At first, you might envy them because they can go to Hapiath, Hiroth and not experience the difficulty that the Israelites did. They're not crying out to God. They don't feel like they have to. Instead, they go forth boldly and they uh, just trust in the strength of their chariots. Well, actually, God blinds them to the danger of going into the Red Sea without him. We see that as they go in, suddenly God just turns everything upside down. The wheels come off of their chariots, the men are thrown from their horses, and all of the army of Egypt is just swallowed up by the Red Sea in judgment. So don't be too down when you meet pain or failures or disappointments in your walk with God. Know that God is using those situations for his glory and so that he can bring you closer to him. I want to end with one true story about a couple. Uh, they're Christian. Their name is Mrs. Clark and Colonel Clark. And they started a mission in the 1880s for homeless people where they would clothe them and feed them mostly with their own money, but also they would share the love of Jesus with them. And so many lives were changed through them. Um, they would produce a weekly radio program called Unshackled that would tell the stories week after week of people whose lives were changed. Well, one day they didn't have money to pay rent for their building and they could have uh, worried, gotten very afraid, panicked that they were going to lose their ministry. But instead, they chose to stand still. They spent all night in prayer to the only one who could really help them. God, their deliverer. And do you know what happened when they woke up in the morning? They opened the door and gasped because on their whole lawn were many, many mushrooms that had sprouted up overnight. And these were expensive, exotic mushrooms that they were able to sell and uh, use the money to continue their ministry. 
So that's a true story. The mushrooms had never grown there before and never grew there again. So we can see through stories like that, that God is good all the time. He is good. Night and day, he led the Israelites. And whether he's calling you today to stand still or to go forward, you can know that he is there with you, working things out in his time for your good, for his glory, and in his way. Let's pray. Dear God, you are holy and good. I confess I'm a sinner who needs Jesus to take my payment for sin on the cross. Thank you for the way that you made for us to be saved, the cross. I believe that Jesus died for me and that you raised Jesus from the dead. Help me when my faith is weak. Thank you for the cross that makes it possible for me to know you and walk with you forever. Help me stand still and go forward with you when there are difficulties and pain in my life. Thank you that you are there for me all the time, night and day. I love you, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy